Hey everybody, welcome to the video. Welcome to the channel. My name is Mike and today we are going to be reviewing the Woodland Mills HM122. Now keep in mind, this is an entry level sawmill. We're gonna be talking about entry level sawmills and this isn't even my mill. I actually borrowed it from a buddy. I'm in the market for the sawmill. He said, why don't you take the Woodland Mills up there and use it for a little bit and uh, see what you think. He was nice enough to let me borrow it. It's been at least three months. We've done a pretty good amount of milling, as you guys just saw. So we're gonna start off with things I don't like and then we'll work into the things that I do like. Actually, before we do that, let's just jump into the basics real fast here. It is an HM122. You can see the price over there in the right-hand corner. The biggest price variance that you see is the engine option, the seven horse or nine and a half horse. 22 inch log diameter, 17 inch wide cant, and 10 foot four is the stock, but you can buy bed extensions for that. All right, let's get into the mill. So like I said, I just got done milling here and I wanted to do that so I could show you where all the sawdust traps are. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just something for you to be aware of if you do end up with this mill, what you're gonna have to keep an eye out for. Now you can see how much sawdust that catches. Now this isn't too big of a deal. If you keep a leaf blower over here, I've got a little hand broom. You just kind of sweep it off at the end of the day when you're done milling. The one that I'm not super excited about is the box tubing on this bunk. This stuff catches sawdust. And even if you take a, a leaf blower or an air compressor and a blow nozzle, stick it down in there, this builds up sawdust pretty good. You can see down on this end, especially on the discharge side of the saw, it's pretty much full on this end. That's a problem for a few reasons. The main reason that's a problem is, is corrosion. The sawdust itself is fairly corrosive, not to mention that it just kind of soaks and holds moisture. And being inside that box tubing, you can't really keep a good eye on it to see what's happening in there. Woodland Mills does have a larger entry level saw. It's an HM130. Bunk system is the exact same with that box tubing. Now, the wood miser, if we talk about wood miser, we're only gonna talk about one saw. It's gonna be the comparable entry level saw, which is their LX25. They go all the way up to pro grade saws. We're talking entry level saws, the LX25. The LX25 has a few things that are different. Two biggest differences that popped out to me between the LX25 and the 122, the wood miser LX25 and the Woodland Mills 122, which is this one. One, the thickness of the steel as far as the height of it goes on the bunk. And these cross members. Now on the wood miser, you can see that it's just kind of open channel. It'd be easier to clean, less likely to hold that sawdust, less likely to corrode or that type of thing. And you can also see that the running rails are quite a bit higher as well, which means there's less likely to get this number going on, which is a pretty big deal if you want that good flat timber. Now, depending on your setup, you can see this is a pretty temporary setup. I just milled some cross members and put underneath where the leveling feet are. And then of course ran a string line down and would make the adjustments I needed to make. But I found myself having to make those adjustments every couple logs. Now, if you're doing a more permanent setup, like you're gonna be on a concrete pad, or maybe you're gonna get your own steel and put some steel beams underneath it to keep it straighter and, and less chances it's gonna move around, it probably won't be that big of a deal for you. But if you plan on having a temporary kind of mobile setup, something you might wanna think about. A couple other differences you'll notice between the LX25, the Wood Miser, and the Woodland Mills is just the style of log clamps. This is just threaded with a point. The Wood Miser has this style. I'm not sure if the pro or con would be. This did seem to work really well. Maybe on that Wood Miser style, you can get a little bit lower clearance, but I was able to get within the bottom half inch of the board and mill down to about an inch, honestly, on this. You can see the stops they have. Now I did call both Woodland Mills and Wood Miser actually this morning. And I will say, as far as customer service goes, they're both fantastic. They both answer the phone, they both answer emails, you can get all the questions answered you need and their websites are fantastic. And they both have YouTube channels. So if there's any information you want more details on after watching this, hop over to Wood Miser's channel, hop over to Woodland Mills channel. I'll put the links in the description. You can get all the information you need there. But I did call them this morning talking about the bunks and asked, is it possible? Oh, how you doing? Now what are you doing? And asked if it was possible if you could just buy the saw head and the carriage unit 
save a little bit of money that way. So if you've got some longer pieces of steel that you wanna make your own custom bunk out of that would work best for where you're at, if it's possible to buy it like that, if you had to buy the bunk with the kit. They both said you have to buy the bunk, but they also made the exact same point that with the sawmill market the way it is, if you bought it with the bunk and didn't want it, you could post the bunk online and within a couple days, you'd probably have it sold. So that's something to think about. You could do it that way if you wanted to make your own bunk, your own style, or if you want to put it on your own trailer. Definitely an option for you. If we work our way up the carriage and we start right here with these little trolley wheels, this is the next thing. Now this is a pretty simple solution and I really like it, but they've got these cables that ride in the groove and they scrape the sawdust. As the carriage rolls, they just ride on top. And then there's one on the bottom as well. Helps keep the track clean and helps keep buildup out of the wheels. But you can see there is a little bit there. It is just one thing you kind of have to look out for what happens after a little bit of, ow, sharp. After a little bit of use, that cable ends up kind of fraying on you and doesn't want to ride under there. This is something we're going to do here in just a minute. We're going to load this up and take it over to the house and get it all pressure washed and cleaned off before we look at the rest of it. But this is something we'll do today is we'll get these cables adjusted so whenever Clint picks it up today, he'll be good to go. It's just another thing you got to kind of look out for. So if I absolutely just pile some sawdust on here, an obnoxious amount of sawdust, you'll see it clean off the top, you'll see it clean off the bottom, and if it works the way it should, that rail should be clean when it comes around. It's honestly a pretty simple and inexpensive solution to keeping that sawdust off and it really works pretty good. You're not going to get any more sawdust build up than that. You just kind of have to watch those cables fray and you keep them tucked in where they need to go and we'll, we'll fix that later here in just a minute. Let's get this thing moved over to the house, get it pressure washed off and we'll take a little bit closer look at the rest of it. Gave it a quick little rinse up at the house. I backed it back down to the pond because, well, the lighting's better and this is YouTube. Anyway, let's open her up and take a gander. There's three latches. One, two, three. And then there's this knob in the middle to hold it all together. Very easy to get in it if you need to change the blade. Nothing fancy going on inside here. Got your clutch. Of course, you got your belt going around, belt tensioner, and this side just has a regular wheel with a tire on it. One thing you'll get on entry level saws is you'll get these wear pads. Now, on higher up level saws, you'll have rollers there instead of the wear pads. Notice how these are fixed as well. When you get higher up in the series of saws, you're going to have one that you can adjust out to the width of the board that you're cutting so the blade doesn't have as much play in it. But this is a pretty narrow cut anyway. So it's not that big of a deal. They just have little Allen screws, little Allen screws right there. And that's something you'll have to do for maintenance is adjust those wear pads as they wear out. And it does show you in the user manual or the operator's manual, how to adjust those guide blocks, those wear pads. It does have a blade guard right here that you can flip down to stay in front of the blade so you don't hit your posts. But um, it was bent and now hits the blade, so it's just bent up for the time being. Let's follow this system up. This is the water lubrication system. Comes up the hose here. Now one thing Woodland Mills does different than other companies is they have this. They're so proud of it. I don't know if you can tell, they laser etch their name on this little valve. Anyway, this valve, this paddle, is attached to the throttle cable. And when you pull the throttle, it opens the water valve. And the water 
should come out. Now this water system is something I had an issue with. If it works well, it's a pretty clever system. The idea is that you don't have a valve open the whole time, you're not wasting all your water. Here's the issue I run into with this system though. It's got this nice tank up here, easy fill spout, really sharp looking welds, I do like them. You have this vent tube over here, and I think this is the main cause of the problem that I keep having. Now, if you have a Woodland Mills mill, tell me if you run into this situation as well. Maybe I'm just crazy here. But if I pull this tube out, water should come out of there. Take the cap off, so you've got plenty of vent. Now, it's dripping, but it's not coming out like it should. Here's what we run into, and I'll do my best to show you. Sawdust gets down into this vent tube and sits down in here and clogs this whole situation up. And then the water doesn't make it down to the blade. I'm trying to get this to show up on a GoPro, which is kind of tricky. But can you see all the dust that's swollen up in there that's got all wet and swelled up on us? It's kind of clogging things up. See it moving around? I don't know how well that's picking up, but you can see chunks that keep coming through there. Can you see all those wood particles that are coming out with it? Every so often you'll see one go by. I'll plug this back in. It's just a quick connect. Now, since we've got everything cleaned out of there, it should flow when we hit the switch. And it does. And we let off the switch, it stops flowing. It's a pretty good system if it works. You save water, you don't forget to turn off your little pet cock so you don't run out of water. You head out to the middle of the next day and then you're out of water and you forgot and you gotta run back to the house and get more. But I'm a big believer in just simplicity. I think I would like just a gravity fed tank with a little pet cock or just a little valve on it and maybe some tubing that is a little bigger that can even handle some of that debris going through there. I think I'd rather run out of water than mess with this adjustment as much as I was messing with it. I don't know, that's just me. It's a clever system, but you know, the whole keep it simple thing. I do think it would be a pretty easy remedy. If, if I owned this mill, if this mill is mine, I would take that whole mechanism off and I just put a regular valve on there with the same tubing. That way it'd be easier for me to flush it. And that way I don't have to mess with it the whole time. Like I said, a little $2 valve or a little $2 adjustment here with some plumbing pieces and you'd probably be set. You'd probably never have to worry about it again. So if we follow the throttle cable from here back, nothing fancy here, just a big old paddle switch. Okay, nothing fancy, sits on this bar. You can adjust this however you want. You want it more forward, you want it down. You can even flip it all the way upside down. So if you put your bunk elevated so you're not bending over the whole time, you can run it like that. It was super comfortable, and if it's not comfortable for you, it's super easy to make comfortable. I do like that part about it, nothing fancy there. So let's say you get done turning your cant, and it's randomly in the middle of the scale. It's not where the scale is actually at. All you gotta do is, it's just a magnet. You just slide it where you want it. Like that. I was cutting four quarter boards or one inch boards. Now that I had it where I wanted it, you just lower it to the measurement you need and you're good to go. It is very user friendly. I didn't have any issues with that at all. I actually kind of like it. It's pretty simple. Like I said, I like the simple solutions. As far as raising and lowering the carriage, it's just this handle. You can hear it click up. You don't have to do anything. You can just stay right there and then you can lower it down too which is pretty nice. If you get to measurement that maybe you're gonna be cutting a lot of and you wanna run it in and lock it, you can run it in and lock it. That is definitely an option. I didn't lock it while I was using it though. I, I mean, it held its position. I never had any issue with it walking anywhere. But it's really comfortable. It's in a good position. There's nothing awkward about it. I like it, no complaints there. As far as the engine goes, you get two options with this entry level. With the 122, you get the seven horse or the nine and a half horse. It's a Kohler engine. Exact same options on the LX25 as well, I believe. Seven horse and nine and a half horse. And I think you can actually get an electric option on the LX25 if I'm not mistaken. Either way, same engine if you're going with the gas engine. Power-wise, it felt great. We're not milling 
pine, okay? Everything I milled, aside for a little bit of poplar, everything I milled was hardwood, either a species of oak or a species of hickory. It was hard milling stuff, power-wise, felt fine. Never had issue with that. In fact, if it was a brand new blade, I mean just right on through. Staying on the topic of the Kohler here. Now, I'm assuming that Kohler does this, puts oil fill and oil drain on both sides because it's a pretty universal power pack that you see in a lot of things nowadays. But Woodland Mills put this nice extension on here, so it's real easy to get your oil drained out of there. That's pretty handy. I will show you how easy it is to change this blade real quick. It's got this big T-handle. Now listen, it's supposed to be like this, but Clint modified this with his grater blade on accident. And guess what? It still does the job it's supposed to do, so that says something, I suppose. Definitely recommend uh, gloves, for sure, because even the dull blades are still incredibly sharp. Blade comes right out. No movie magic here, it's just the same blade because I don't have any more, I'm out. I just want to show you how easy it comes on and off. Blade goes back in. There's nothing complicated about that at all. This is where your gloves come, in, come into play at. Just like that. Then you just run the T-handle in a little bit. There's a nut welded onto the end of this T-handle. I don't know if you can see it from there. Clint's got a torque wrench. He knows what torque he wants his band at, and I believe it comes with specs. You just turn it until she clicks. There you go. Takes all the guesswork out of it. So you always got the tension you need. Yeah, that's pretty simple. Pretty simple indeed. Now, if there's any questions about this, of course they have the little can on the side that has the manual and it has everything you need to know in here. For every part, it is on this saw. It'll also break it down by horsepower. Anything you could need, it is all listed here. And it has the layout for everything as well. It's honestly set up as user friendly as you can get. And since it stays with the saw, you should never have any reason to not know the parts you need. And I do want to point out they have lots of accessories as well. Something pretty cool, they got that custom fitted sawmill cover. So if you don't want to pay for a shelter right away, if you're just kind of exploring the mills, you can kind of do that as an inexpensive option to protect your mill. Of course, sharpeners and setters. There's that adjustable blade guide we were talking about. You can upgrade to that. Extra log clamps. They have that winch post kit, which is kind of cool. If you don't have a tractor to help get the log up, you can use that little winch kit. And they do have these Bushlander trailers that they sell as well that you can mount the mill on, which would be pretty handy. You could pull it where you wanted to in the woods. Now, it's been a few days since I did the review video, and I wanted to wait till the previous video posted so I could kind of read through the comments. This is not a milling channel. We don't do a lot of milling, and I want to make sure I addressed all the milling concerns in the last milling video that we're going to do, at least for a while anyway. If you missed the previous video, like we said earlier, we kind of went over the cost, and basically we summarized why for us, for us, an entry-level mill or a portable bandsaw mill just didn't make sense. The main reason is Indiana's largest hardwood operation is 20 minutes that way, and they're good people, and we can go up there and get what we need to get. As far as supply for us, even though it looks like we have a lot of timber, most of our stuff isn't mature enough or in a good enough rotation yet that we're ready to start harvesting that to mill. Aside from the one-off tree that might blow down each year that we could cut up, we really just don't have much of a supply on our property to build enough things to recoup that cost. But some people made an excellent point, and it's if you enjoy it, and that is very true. These entry-level mills, also hobby mills, it's just that. If it's something you enjoy, if it's that therapy for you, if it gives you that happiness, it gives you that escape you're looking for, then yeah, it's probably worth it. Lucky for us, we've got enough projects going on on the property. I've got all this escape and therapy I need for working out in the woods. 
As far as this mill goes, you get what you pay for. It's an entry level mill, so you get entry level features. If you're just kind of wanting to experiment with it and see how you feel, it's a good mill for that. I think the LX25 would be a good mill for that as well. And both Woodmiser and Woodland Mills, like I talked to them in the, in the phone conversation, very simply put, the market for sawmills is super hot right now. So if you buy an HM122 and you think, you know what, I like it, but I'd like to upgrade, you'd be able to turn around and flip that thing and sell it pretty quickly, mainly because of the lead time on getting one ordered. But you could be able to get rid of that and offload it pretty quick for pretty close to what you paid for it, probably, and then go ahead and upgrade from there. Now, if you want to see other channels that are on the upper end out of the woods with nathan is fantastic and they just got oh gosh guys help me out an lt70 i think he bought an lt70 which is i think it's close to seventy five thousand dollars saw it's a heck of a setup very impressive and on the upper end of the portable sawmill so if you want to see that into the spectrum check out check out that channel i'll put a link in the description as well and if you want to see more hm122 action probably the most efficient or most effective setup I've seen with that HM122 is sawing with Sandy. The way he's got that thing set up, just speed as far as what he's cutting, where the cuts go and how he handles everything. It's awesome. It's as effective and as efficient as I think a fella could get it. So check out sawing with Sandy. That'll be in the description as well. And just tell those guys I said, hey, I don't know if they know that I watch their channel, but you know, tell them I said, hey, anyway, it's just kind of cool the way the YouTube community works. I just keep getting distracted. How's a fella not supposed to? I did fly the drone that day too, so we'll finish this whole thing off with the drone footage. The last thoughts on it, the couple things I had complaints about, the water system, you saw in the video, super easy, cheap fix to make it your own. And the bunk system, part of the convenience of these sawmills are they're shipped to your door. So they're gonna come in pieces unless they come on a trailer. And honestly, if you're buying a sawmill, you probably have the resources to make that bunk what you want it with getting some steel or just reinforcing it or putting it on a trailer. And it really wouldn't be that big of an issue. We did mention that video that we needed more timber. So we will be going out to Logger Wades one day. We'll be placing a timber order and going to pick some stuff up, hopefully. Maybe we can give you a little tour of that operation because that is incredible. It is so cool to see that operation. And maybe we can get Wade to try to explain timber price is a little bit better. We talked about it a lot and that, that part came up in the, in the comments, the words today, the, the words every day. You guys know I have a hard time with words. The price of board foot came up in the comments quite a bit as well. And here, this is what a market sheet looks like. This is what they use to determine prices. And if you can decipher this, you know, more power to you. I can't, but Wade can. You gotta keep in mind that different grades, there's different faces, there's different lots of things whenever you're buying timber. And maybe we can get Wade to uh, explain that a little bit better to us and make more sense, you know, dumb it down for people like us. Not that we're, you guys, that's not what I meant. Don't take that personal. I tell you what, I think that's enough rambling about mills. I think it's time to get back to our normal homestead stuff, which will be the YouTube yacht soon. And then quite a bit of work for Dirt Perfect as well. We're gonna be bouncing between those two things. And of course, we got the fabrication projects coming up as well, like we talked about, a dump trailer for the 755, a ripper attachment for behind the 755, because we run it like a D9, so why not put a ripper behind it? And uh, there was another one, a grapple for the front end loader. That's another thing I want to build too. So that's kind of what we have coming up. Lots of irons in the fire, but we got a decent sized fire here, so hopefully we'll be okay with it all. I do appreciate you guys watching. I appreciate you stopping by like you always do. How do my outros go? I don't know. We'll catch you on the next one. That's not the right rhythm. I don't think that's it.